Okay, so hi guys, I'm Robin, uh, and I'm going to be presenting on AngularJS. So how many of you have used AngularJS in any of your previous projects? Uh, just one person. All right, I think this is going to be interesting because this is a kind of a beginner's AngularJS session. It won't go into much detail, so I think you guys might benefit from this one. So I have uh, separated the session into four sections, so it's easier to digest why you want to use AngularJS, if you want to use AngularJS. Uh, starts with what is AngularJS and why should you use it, how to use it if you want to use it, and when should you not use it. So what is an AngularJS? Um, Wikipedia says it's an open source web application framework maintained by Google and community, assists in creating single page applications. What it basically means is it's a JavaScript application, a JavaScript framework, which allows you to build, uh, they, they said single page applications, but it's, it's not precisely single page. By single page, they mean to say that you only have one page to load, and it basically loads uh, various other partials or HTML files. Uh, basically, this means that the HTML won't be, the browser won't be refreshed. So it, it basically means your, your application will be much more responsive. And a little bit about the architecture of the framework. It's based on MVVM architecture. Uh, I think you guys must have heard of the MVC framework, which is used by almost all of the frameworks today, PHP and many JavaScript frameworks. This is based on MVVM, which stands for the model, view, and view model. This is a bit interesting, and it's actually based on the Microsoft technology. Um, you have the model, which has the real, actual data, and uh, you can have many, many services inside the model, like you want to save something to the database, or maybe you want to save on the browser's local storage. And there's a view, which is just an HTML view. Uh, and in between them, there's a view model, which is quite interesting because it provides you of a way to have uh, real-time two-way data binding. So if you have the view and you have the view model and you have a st standard variable inside both of them, if you change something in the view, the view model will also be updated. And if you change in the view model, the view would be updated. So you don't have to do anything like generally you have to do with jQuery and stuff. So another interesting differentiation is uh, like jQuery uses imperative form of programming and AngularJS believes in declarative form. And generally, imperative is good for uh, when you want to define the business logic instead of the building the UI. Uh, I can give you an example in jQuery. Whenever you want to do something in jQuery, you basically look for the DOM element and then assign maybe a click listener or something. The DOM does not declare something that this is supposed to do this thing. You just do it inside the JavaScript code, which does not really make much sense if you have uh, maybe a big UI. And inside, in case of AngularJS, you have declarations. So uh, maybe on the DOM element, you have this element is supposed to maybe open a message, open a pop-up. So you don't generally do it inside the, uh, directly inside the JavaScript file. You don't manage the DOM. That's done automatically by AngularJS. So let me show you a, a demo of what I mean by these two. Okay, so this example is basically a simple uh, imperative versus declarative example, which does the same thing by one uses the imperative way of doing it, the other is the angular way of doing it. And it's simple, just a pop-up alert box, and both do the same thing. And if you look at the DOM element here, this is the, sorry, this is the anchor tag, and it basically has an ID, which is used by jQuery in the, inside the script. So the jQuery does it in imperative way, where it tries to find out the element, which is the imperative button ID, and then it, on click, it assigns a click listener to alert something. So if you look at the DOM, you, you have no way of knowing that this is going to click something. When you click something, it's going to open a pop-up or something. 
because there is no uh, description of the things it's going gonna, it's gonna to do. But in case of Angular's example, which is below, you can see I have the same anchor tag, but now I have an ng click directive, and which says do something. What it means that when, you, when somebody clicks on it, it's going to run this, this function called do something, and then you can look inside the JavaScript code that there is a function named do something. So it does the same thing, but slightly differently, which makes a lot of sense if you have a bigger UI, because it declares what you want to do instead of just hiding inside the JavaScript file. So <coughs> why should you use AngularJS when you have so many frameworks? One of the main problems with HTML is it was not designed for web applications in mind. And as you all know, it's quite old now. Even the HTML5 is now quite old. But still, it was not designed to cater to a uh, web application at heart. So for example, if you create something simple as tabs and panes in HTML, and maybe you use Twitter Bootstrap or something like that, there's a lot of uh, code which is not supposed to be there. I mean, if somebody looks at the code, it does not make sense. Why do you have so much code? So let's see an example but what I mean. So this is just a simple uh, tabs and pins, and this uses um, your bootstrap and jQuery. And inside the markup, you can see, this is the markup for the tabs at the top, which is just uh, a UL and LI and inside the anchor tags. So when somebody looks at it from the designer's point of view, it does not tell you anything that this is supposed to look like tabs. It's just a, a, a number of list items. And the tab contents is another div. And if you think about it, in, an, in a normal human being's w uh, way of human beings thing, there should be a tab and there should be some content. They don't generally think about, I should have these list items and, and, and maybe another div, which will have another div that will have a few items and then think about the CSS and JavaScript. It just increases the complexity if you have maybe hundreds of pages like this. And let's look at how you would do the same thing in AngularJS. So in here, I have this tabs element, which the name says this is a tab, so it's easier for human beings to understand. Even normal, uh, any person who's not used to HTML can understand it's supposed to be a tab here. And inside here, I have a pane. And this refers to the first tab and the content. So I have given the title as sessions, which comes up at the, the title of the tab. And the content is just normal HTML. The same is for the next tab. So as you can imagine, if you have much more complicated UIs, maybe you have a number of profile images, or maybe a forum post, you can have like one tag for profile instead of a div, and inside a div, another span, another 10 things un underneath. You can have maybe one, uh, one profile tag, and all of, your all of the developers in your team can use just one tag, and it just basically reduces the complexity of your app when you look at the, uh, at the markup, HTML markup. Okay. Uh, another, but I've already told about this benefit is extending the HTML vocabulary by using directives. Like in the previous uh, demo, I showed that we can have tabs and pins and other kinds of directives. Uh, these are called directives, by the way, which means that you can have, uh, you can make your own tabs. Uh, sorry, make your own HTML elements, and you can even make your own attributes like. Maybe you have the tab and you had the title attribute. You can maybe have another kind of attribute, maybe it's, uh, username attribute, something. So it basically allows you to extend the HTML's vocabulary. And like I said before, it has two-way data binding. So I explained a little bit earlier that you have the model and the view. And the view model and the view get synced. The data gets synced. So how does it work, actually? I have this example which uses jQuery for doing the same thing. 
it's not exactly the two way in this example, but it kind of shows you the principle, the kind of thing I'm trying to prove here, which is you have this input field, and when I change something, in real time it changes it here. So the, I've bound this variable, uh, bound this, this span tag, which is just, just this, just sorry, this thing here. I bound this spam to have the content of the input field. Uh, and this is a lot of code inside jQuery, even though jQuery is a really good, uh, very concise library. So this is the input field, and I've given it an ID of name. Inside the script, I'm trying to find the name and adding an input type of uh, listener. So whenever somebody changes something, it's gonna fire this function inside here. This and inside this function, I'm just getting the name to, to get the value of what I put inside the input field and changing the HTML of this span tag here. But let's look, this, look at the same example of how I would accomplish in AngularJS. So this does the same thing, but the difference is, if you can see, I have the input field and I don't even need an ID for that. I've assigned a directive called uh, an attribute called ng model, which is a special kind of Angular directive which says that this is this basically assigns to the model. So I've given the name of the model as the name. So this is the name of the model, and I can I can assign it anything. It's basically like a variable on the model, and inside my 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 span tag, like you, I had span tag in previous example. I just have this, uh, this curly braces and within it I have the name of the variable. So this basically means that angle, anything within the braces means this is processed by AngularJS. So within these braces I have the name of the same variable and if I change something, change anything, it's gonna be, it's gonna be updated in real time and I don't have to do anything. So inside my JavaScript, I only have this amount of code, which is just initializing the Angular app. So as you can see, this, this saves a lot of code inside your JavaScript files, because Angular is doing a lot of things behind the scenes. But this is also something, uh, something interesting, which I did not do in my JavaScript uh, in a previous example, was if I change something asynchronously, it's gonna change the view as well, and it's gonna change, the, change everything. So like if I had a, maybe an AJAX service which loads something from the back end of CVC, CVCRM and it had new data inside, it's gonna change the model. Okay, it's gonna change the model inside JavaScript. But it's gonna also change the, this thing here automatically for you because everything is bound to the model. So you don't have to do all, all those things which were quite a bit of code if I wanted to do in, Java, in, in jQuery. The other reasons why you should use AngularJS, like it is really rapid prototyping. So if you have a tool you wanna build, you wanna test how it works, you can really quickly build it in AngularJS because you have all this pre-existing functionality like <coughs> your directives are there, you have two-way data binding, you have controllers and many other things. It just makes your job much, much faster than you were if you were to use jQuery or something like that. And it promotes a really good application structuring. Um, it does not force you to do that. Like in my previous example, I just had Angular module. I just declared the Angular module. I did not have any code, but it allows you to have maybe a controller, a directive, services, factories. So there are many ways to organize your code, which is quite good if you have a really big application, which like maybe 10,000 lines of JavaScript files, JavaScript code. and if you have something similar in jQuery, it does not provide you with structuring ways. So you have to manually think about structuring and it's likely that it's gonna change with, with developers. Each individual developers might have different way of structuring code, but it provides you a nice way, but it does not force you to do that. So you have that freedom as well. And improves the readability of your application code, like I can have my custom directives and stuff like that. I can have my controllers, I can have uh, factories, which just makes sense because it's just software engineering. 
And one of the most powerful things in AngularJS is testability. And from the start, it was built with testing in mind. So everything inside, J uh, in inside Angular can be tested very easily. It provides you with tools like uh, they have a JavaScript task, uh, your test runner called Karma, which is also been developed by AngularJS team. And it uses a lot of dependency injection, which I'm going to talk about next, uh, which means you can mock services in your unit test. So for example, if you want to mock your, uh, maybe an AJAX request for your unit testing, you can simply create a mock instead of just sending a real AJAX request. And uh, basically helps you a lot in your uh, unit tests. So this is how basically dependency injection works in general and in AngularJS, if you guys, uh, if somebody is not aware of how, how this is. Um, it means that you have a component and it requires certain things. And dependency in, in injection is when you need something, you get it, you just get it. You don't have to instantiate stuff on your own. Like, take an example that you have, you are building some profile page or something. So in a profile page, uh, generally you will have a constructor for your maybe user account. Then you will create a user, you instantiate a user, and you have to do a number of steps, like instantiate a user, instantiate maybe uh, feeds, instantiate maybe configuration of the application, these are a lot of code which are quite redundant in your applications because you have to do it again and again, and each developer has to learn this special way of doing things with your application. But dependency injection makes it a lot easier because it just defines that you need this thing and you just get it. You don't have to define stuff. You just, because the developer who has built the component already has the factories and constructors and various methods for doing it for you. So like, if you need maybe an HTTP a service, you just say, I need an HTTP service, and you just get it. So let's look at an example. I don't think I have put an example for this one, but I can still show you. So in this example, if I need an HTTP service in this module, I'll just say HTTP. And it basically means that Angular will try to find the HTTP service it will instantiate um, instance of the HTTP service, do all of the configuration behind the scenes, and we provide you with the HTTP service. So this way you can do, I mean, basically reduces a lot of code which is not required. And this is not a st only pattern which is used in AngularJS, it's quite used in many other frameworks like Laravel and PHP and stuff like that. But it's good to see this, this catching on in JavaScript world. Now these are some of the benefits for the end users. So like you can have much richer application in AngularJS because everything is so fast. The responsiveness is uh, increased quite a bit because, uh, because inside, if you have a normal traditional a PHP application, you have to load pages individually. So if you go to next page, it reloads the entire page, which is not really required. In case of AngularJS, you can just send an AJAX request and get a JSON back, which is, makes it a lot fluid, so users don't have to wait. You can have fluid animations from one page to another one. Uh, it just basically means that users don't have to wait for too long. And it reduces the bandwidth as well. So uh, like take an example of a normal PHP page. When somebody loads it, it has to load everything again and again on every page. And if the browser use, you're using it does not have good caching, uh, like maybe you're using an old browser, it does not have good caching, it has to load again and again the same things, maybe the same image, which could be a waste when you're using maybe a mobile device for accessing your, your website or application. But if you're using AngularJS or something like that, you can send an AJAX request to maybe a service, HTTP service, maybe an API backend you have, and you only receive what you need, like a JSON data, which is like nothing when you compare it to uh, the entire page which loads. So it saves a lot of bandwidth, which is especially useful in mobile cases. So if you've decided that you like AngularJS till now, then how do you use it in CVCRM? 
It's actually really simple in 4.5 and up because the core team has gonna done a great job in integrating the hooks for creating Angular pages. But when I started using AngularJS in CVCRM, it was in 4.4, so I had to do a lot of manual work to get it to work. It w it's not too hard, but the 4.5 makes it really easy. The way you do it, you just create your extension as usual, uh, nothing special about that. You just add one hook, which is this uh, Angular modules hook, and inside this hook, you define your extension, the extension's name, the JavaScript file, and optionally, you can also specify a CSS file, and uh, you can also specify multiple JavaScript files, multiple CSS files, so you're not restricted to just one file. And the next stage is that you add your JavaScript file to, JavaScript code to the file. Uh, this is a self-invoking function expression. If you're not aware of this, it just basically wraps all of your code within a function, which just invokes automatically. It's quite useful when you wanna, uh, maybe don't want a global scope of your application and don't want it to conflict with other parts of your application. Um, inside this, we're using the reference to Angular and CRM dot dollar and CRM dot underscore. I think the underscore stand for Lodash, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But the dollar is for the, the jQuery and Angular is just the Angular library. And inside this, you have the CRM provides a helper function called resource URLs. Basically allows you to get the URL for the resources folder. Um, and then after this, you just have the standard Angular code, which is like you define a module and then you configure that module. And in this configuration, you're just setting up a few routes. Like if somebody goes to this URL slash examples, it will open this partial, which is the HTML file and uh, run this controller. And the controller is explained below, just an example controller. Um, yeah, it's basically really simple with, if you wanna use it on 4.5. And the next part is you create your HTML partial, which is um, just a simple HTML. It does not include the HTML tags at top and bottom and script tags. It, as the name suggests, it's a partial, which means part of your code is part of your HTML. So you can have multiple partials, maybe one for your profile, maybe you create a profile and you create a partial for that. Another partial may be a listing of profile uh, number of users. So you can have multiple uh, partials and load them as you want anytime um, because it uses Ajax behind the scenes. And by the way, this implementation is available on this URL, which is just CVCRM's uh, GitHub account. If you just go to the 4.5 branch, you probably find this. So if AngularJS is so perfect, why would you not use it? There are some times when it does not make sense to use AngularJS, like if you have a really simple application, like uh, maybe a one page application, which just details of some stuff like maybe a profile page with only the name and address of someone, you don't generally need AngularJS because it's gonna add a lot of overheads. In terms of the, all the boilerplate code you have to add initially, and even for new developers, it might be a bit hard to understand what's going on because complexity is always, not always good. It, it is good in initially when you have, you know, when you're building a big application, it helps you structure, but when you're something really small, I think jQuery could be more than enough for you. Another problem could be legacy browser support, which is, I believe this is quite big for some people. Like, at the version 3, 1.3 of AngularJS, which is currently in beta version, um, they're dropping the support for Internet Explorer 8, which might be a deal breaker for some people. But they do have, they used to have support for one point, uh, the Internet Explorer 8 in the 1.2 version. Um, which is the mainstream version right now. Another problem could be reliance on JavaScript. So like if you wanna use, uh, if you have some people who don't wanna use JavaScript for some reason, who disable the JavaScript, your application is not gonna work at all, which could be a big problem, but I think most people have JavaScript turn on these days. I've never seen someone turn, turning off JavaScript for uh, 
some people do, but it's, it's not. It's this minority. Um, something is something to take in take into consideration. So this was part of my presentation, and for this presentation, I also made a demo module in CVCRM, which I might be able to show if, because I have time. Uh, this is just, uh, it took me around maybe two and a half hours to build this stuff. It's just standard CVCRM extension using 4.5, using the hooks like I said. And this is just a listing of the sessions, CVC, uh, CVCon sessions. So you can add a new session here, which is like almost instantly. So it does not refresh the page. It just shows up the notification, which is using CVCRM's uh, standard notification. And uh, it basically uses AJAX, and it's quite responsive. So you delete stuff, you add stuff, you can edit stuff. And it's really quick and very good on the, on the bandwidth if you want to use maybe a mobile device or something. Um, I can show some code right now. So so this is uh, this is basically the code for registering your your module if you want to use angular js uh, which basically you define your extensions name and your javascript files as an array and the css files and that's it, that's, that's all you have to do inside CVCRM. And the rest is your JavaScript file, which is inside this directory, JS. This is the same stuff which I just showed uh, some time ago, but it's slightly more because this is an application. And I basically have two routes here. One is for the slash CVCon. Another one is for slash CVCon slash new, which is for when you want to create a new s session. And the third one is for self CVCon slash edit slash uh, slash ID slash edit, which is for editing a previous previously a previous session. If you notice here, the ID has a colon be uh, before it, which means that this is something which is be which can be passed, which can be passed by the root, uh, which can be retrieved uh, inside your controller. So this is kind of like a variable. It changes, it's not fixed. So I can have maybe a number, one, two, three, four, to basically implement a restful URL, uh, like in this. If you just, if I just hover into this link, you can see it's cvcon slash one slash edit. And if I look at the next one, it is slash two slash edit. And the two basically refers to the ID of the session. So I have this one. This is the controller for the listing of the sessions. And this is the controller for editing the session. And I'm using the same controller for also when you're editing and, and you're creating new one. I'm just reusing it a little bit. And this is the first controller. And Basically, the first line j just says that uh, some of the uh, configuration for the HTTP request I'm going to make to the CVCRM's RESTful URL, which is slash CVCRM slash AJAX slash REST. So the top one is the entity. You just give the entity the name of the entity, which is the CV ses CVCon session, which I have built. Then the action you need, which is the get. And uh, this code, basically, is what actually calls the pass, uh, the post the request to the CVs, CVCRM's uh, REST, REST backend, basically. So I have this data, which is serialized because I'm sending over the post request. And this, is, this basically works on, the way it works in, CV, in AngularJS is it uses a concept called Promise API, if you guys have heard of it. In stuff like jQuery and stuff, you 
generally have callback functions. So when somebody, something happens, you want to call some function. Like if you requ receive some request, some data from the server, you want to call some function back. Maybe to update some news feed or maybe show a pop-up with the new data. <coughs> but inside, uh, inside your AngularJS, it provides you a promise API. Uh, promises, which is like they have the library called Q. And it basically means you can have a number of methods when something happens. Like in this case, after the post, I have one method called success and another method called error. So if the post request is successful, it's going to run this method inside success. Or if something, if something goes wrong, it's going to run the error methods, um, which is quite nice because it looks like normal jQuery stuff where you have the callback function. But it's not actually normal callback functions. Because sometimes you can have nesting of callback functions, like you have done something, you receive some request, and if successful, you want to do something else, and you want to do something else with that request, and you keep doing it four or five times, you have quite a big nesting of your functions, which is, which really uh, decreases the readability of your code and just increases the amount of errors you can have. Uh, inside your this kind of pattern, which is the uh, promise API. You can chain promises, like you have success here, and if you return the success to some some other person, some some other code which is requesting this uh, this promise, you can chain promises. So, like for example, if I have a method and I return something, if I return this promise, and the caller of this method can chain stuff. So, if there is success, they can chain stuff. They can pass, pass it back, and people can keep chaining stuff. Methods can keep chaining stuff until you get what you want, which is quite interesting because you can have your controllers really slim and de depend on services, which I'm not used in this example just to keep this, keep this application really simple. But it allows you to have controllers uh, very slim, like which most, uh, most uh, software developers tend to like in languages like uh, PHP or C Sharp or stuff like that. So you can have a very, very slim controllers and you can depend on your services, which are like your models, you can say, in other languages, in MVC frameworks. And in services, maybe you can have a service to retrieve uh, profile data. So in here, you can, in the entire controller, you can just have give me profile data dot get profile. And it's gonna do all those behind the scenes and that will return a promise to you. And you can use that promise to do whatever you want inside your view. Uh, which really makes your controller really slim and easier to maintain. And this is basically the delete, delete operation when you delete something. What it does, it, it does the same thing. I'm not reuse the code in this example just to keep it simple, but it's sending the same post request but with delete action. So when something is deleted, it's basically on success, it removes the item from the listing because uh, everything is stored inside the listing. Like we, have, we receive all of these sessions previously. Inside here, we assign all of the sessions to scope.sessions initially when we list, this, list all of the sessions. When deleting stuff, it basically means I send a request to the API to delete, delete and then I delete it from the view. Uh, which is just a JavaScript splice function on this sessions array. And then I just send this alert message, which is using the CVCRM's inbuilt native alert, alert box. And if something goes wrong, I can alert using the error type. And similarly, this is, this is the code for the editing your sessions. Yeah, all of this code I'm gonna put on GitHub so you guys can just play around a little bit and maybe learn something if you wanna try something new. Uh, and I'm probably gonna put these slides also on GitHub so you can guys can refer to it in the future. This is my GitHub username, which is just my first name and last name, Robin Mitra. And if you wanna follow me on Twitter if you want, I post some Angular stuff sometimes and my website. That's it guys, any questions?
Yes. Yes, uh, backbone is, is, is a good framework, I must say. But Angular is kind of a different way of handling this beast. Like in backbone, you have a lot of uh, boilerplate code which you have to do in order to achieve something simple. And in AngularJS, you don't have to do that. It does a lot of things. And another important thing is the philosophy AngularJS has. Like AngularJS believes in extending the functionality of HTML instead of overriding it in Backbone and Ember.js, those kinds of things. You override stuff. Okay, you pro provide your own functionality instead of using HTML's functionality. So like I showed you in the example, you can have directives and stuff. Uh, even the routing inside AngularJS, uh, it, it does not, it uses the standard HTML href. It does not use anything fancy like uh, another kind of directive. Most of the stuff, it tries to reuse HTML and just extend it as a language. The permissions you have to define, so it depends on how you want to use the permissions. Like uh, if you're using Drupal, you can probably define a, a, Drupal, UR, a Drupal permissions. And inside your, uh, probably inside your. Yeah, uh, but you can limit the access to the application. I'm not sure you can, if you can access, limit ac access to the partials, which are different pages within your Angular application. Because since, it is, since it's a uh, JavaScript application, you can probably look in the co code, look in the source, and just manually retrieve the documents. But you can limit access to the, f to the entire application. Yeah. Uh, like, let me show you the example here. You can probably limit the access to, to this part, maybe, if you don't want people to access it. I'm not sure what the core team has done inside 4.5 to limit access within this part. But in. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? Right, I think that's about it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>